Hola y bienvenido a Resto e Historia. Conmigo, el bello grande Dominic Sandbrook, y con mi criado, o jugador de cricket Tom Holland, que siempre fala sobre el cristianismo. Saudações a todos los nuestros discípulos y seguidores. Y una saudación especial a los nuestros amigos de Wolverhampton, los mejores futbolistas portugueses del mundo. Hola, Gonzalo Guesh. Hola, Jean Moutinho. Hola, Matej Nunes. Hola, Ruben Neves. O Capitao, nuestro Arohi. Tom Holland, I know you love a bit of Portuguese. I thought that was Dutch. No, no, no. That was, that was absolutely... That was absolutely pitch perfect fluent portuguese tom and i'm sure our portuguese listeners so impressed. will be writing in to offer their congratulations was that ju- jugador de cricket i heard <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> nothing else to know is there it's actually worth doing this podcast purely for the pleasure of mangling um continental languages isn't it so yesterday tom we kicked off our our um, our history of portugal this sort of epic story that we're telling um, and we got up to the death of Henry the Navigator. So the Portuguese, they've they've established this sort of medieval kingdom, one of many kingdoms on the Iberian Peninsula. They're not yet defining themselves against Spain. Um, they have expanded to Madeira and the Azores, and they have this sort of sense of mission, don't they? So Henry the Navigator died in 1460, and that's seven years after the Turks have captured Constantinople. Rome really has finally fallen and Christendom is under attack. And I don't know about you, but I think that's hugely important in explaining the kind of militancy and the sense of mission that the Portuguese have in the next sort of 50 to 100 years or so, don't you? Though it obviously helps that it also makes them very rich. So <laughs> You're so cynical. <laughs> well, no, I think, I mean, we, we talked about that in the last episode, the way that, you know, the lust for spice fuses with a sense that this is, this is what God wants. So yeah. Henry the Navigator, obviously, he is fascinated and obsessed by exploration, but he is also the Grand Master of the Military Order of Christ, which is um, a, a successor to the Knights Templar, a kind of the militant order of knights who fought in the Crusades. So I think you get, I think you get both, um, and I think that that kind of combination of greed and kind of Christian militancy conviction that that God wants you to to go out and grab things from Muslims. It explains why today's story, which is the story of Portugal's expansion um, down the coast of Africa and then into the Indian Ocean, is a bloody as well as a heroic story. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because um, when you read this story, and I, I should sort of shout out, there's a, there's a book by um, Roger Crowley called Conquerors that I reviewed a few years ago for the Sunday Times, gave it a rave review, actually, because I really enjoyed it. And he told it as an absolutely sort of rip-roaring, rollicking adventure story, although one completely soaked with blood. And it is one of these things where you sort of think there's so much fuss made about Columbus and about the conquistadors, but the Portuguese have have sort of escaped all that because nobody really, you know, people don't speak Portuguese in Anglo-Saxon countries and they don't know what's happening. But there's an awful lot of, of terrible violence, isn't there? So Columbus venturing out into the, the the vast emptiness of the Atlantic, I mean, you, you, that is there's an inherent drama there. But I think there is also an incredible drama in the idea of sailing down a landmass that you know nothing about. You don't know yeah. what's what you're going to find there, and the way in which when these expeditions start going down Africa to try and get to India, they take with them these pillars, don't they? Stone pillars. Stone pillars. And they set them up in in bays as kind of way markers. And I suppose you could say, well, you know, these are markers of colonization. I mean, it's almost a kind of an expression of impotence before the vastness of the task. As though all you can do is put one small stone pillar. The only mark that you can leave on the vastness of this, you know, strange lands full of strange creatures, strange peoples, strange plants. Um, yeah, it's a, a, a very kind of, and I, I, I think also that that when thinking about this, because we know what's going to happen, because we know the, um, the the brutal history that's going to follow, and we know that the Portuguese make it, and we know that in the long run, Europe is going to expand its hegemony across the world. We need to park that and think that Portugal is a tiny peripheral power, and the the sheer kind of boldness and daring of what they're attempting 
you know, you have to keep that in mind if you're going to have a sense of just how extraordinary a story this is. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. So, so Henry the Navigator died in 1460, and the guy who takes over the sort of mission ultimately is um, his great nephew, who is Zhao. Prince Zhao, who becomes the king of Portugal in 1481. And he's a sort of very melancholy, sort of lugubrious fellow. He's got a long face, isn't he? He's got a very long face yeah. and a black beard. Um, the Portuguese remember him apparently as the perfect prince. And um, Isabella, I read that Isabella, Queen of Castile, called him simply the man. Presumably she called him El Hombre because he was such an impressive fellow. So he basically has this desire, like Henry the Navigator, to be rich. But he also is very into the Prester John thing. So the idea that there's a Christian kingdom out there that they can make an alliance with against the Islamic powers. And also, crucially, to find a route to the Indies, so to get the spices. And what's funny is he turns down Columbus. Columbus, I mean, actually, the funny thing is people always tell that story and they say, the Portuguese, what Muppets, they turned down Columbus. But of course, they were quite right. Columbus says, I can go west and find the Indies. And they say, yeah, don't bother, mate. You know, good luck. We're going to go our way. Which we, and we'll get, and they do get there. I mean, they weren't wrong. Well, when in due course, um, Vasco da Gama does get to India, uh, Manuel, who succeeds Jao, he doesn't he, he write, <laughs> yeah, he writes to uh, Ferdinand and Isabella and says, um, you know, he describes all the stuff that they found in India. So, all the cinnamon, the cloves, the ginger, the nutmegs, the pepper, the diamonds, the rubies, everything. And he, he says, We are aware that your highness will hear of these things with much pleasure and satisfaction. <laughs> which is, <laughs> yeah, yeah, which I think is, is splendid behavior. That's like, that's like the way you behave to rival history podcasters, Tom, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, well, we all share. We we all take pleasure in each other's successes. Of course, we do. Of course, we do. So, so the first guy they send is um, this guy Diogo Cow, and he goes down to. I mean, he he goes a hell of a long way. I have to say, he goes to the Congo. He goes, sails a bit up the Congo, and he actually leaves a pillar there that's not discovered for another few hundred years. Yeah, so he, he's dropping off these pillars everywhere. Angola, Namibia. I mean, Namibia. That's a, a colossal journey. You know, it's. It's such a long way, and we know so little about him. So we know very – actually, it's, it's, that's the case with some of his successors as well. So they're sort of – they sail for 500 miles up the Senegal River. Um, they go up the Gambia. They're crossing the desert. They're going to Timbuktu. So the Portuguese are convinced that they can find the route to India, and, um, and they're also that they can find this guy, Prester John. And also gold, the supply of gold. Yeah, because they know there's gold out there somewhere i mean this is a bit like the spanish in the americas we, we all know the story of the spanish in the americas i actually like the portuguese story better because it's so it's not so hackneyed is it we don't know so much about it i suppose so the last um pillar that uh cow sets up is on black rocks where seals are basking and then he turns back around it's such a kind of powerful image yeah so the next guy is um bartholomew diaz bartholomew diaz I think uh, would be how the, how, how it's how the Dutch would, would pronounce it. Bartholomew <laughs> <laughs> Diaz. And that is how they say it, Tom. That yeah. is how they say it. Yeah. Maybe. I was once on a train by with, uh, it's a very strange story, this. I was going to Barcelona and um, I was sitting in the compartment opposite a couple. Uh, the man had no legs and the woman had no arms. Oh. I mean, it was very, they were a good team. They yeah. were a very good team. <laughs> And uh, they were Portuguese, and it was the first time I'd ever heard Portuguese people. And they had this sort of – at first I thought they were speaking Russian because there were so many of the sort of shh and the sort of yow kind of sounds. Uh, and then I discovered they were talking Portuguese, and they said they could understand Spanish, but the Spanish couldn't understand them. So, so yeah, well. So that's, that's my great linguistic insight for today's episode. Amazing, amazing. Thank podcast. you for that. Anyway, can we get back to Bartolomeu Dias? Yeah, so he leaves. He's a knight. He's a, one of Zhao's knights, and and basically, um, Zhao says to him, "Off you go. I'll give you two of these caravels." Now, if you don't know what a caravel is, Tom gives a brilliant, <laughs> brilliant uh, excursion into naval technology. Yes, I did <laughs> in our previous podcast. Shallow bottoms, and crucially, Tom, what else have they got? They got uh, triangular sails. Triangular sails, exactly. Triangular. And what does sails. that mean, Dominic? Uh, it means that they can do what they like with the wind. <laughs> and, uh, they can literally do what they like. Is that what it means? Yeah. 
there. That, that's exactly what it means. I think that's <laughs> that's. Uh, I learned that from NAM Roger, the great naval historian. He told me they were his precise words. Yeah. Um, right. So, so they set off. They set off in um, the summer of 1487. We know very little about Bartholomew Diaz. We don't even know when his his expedition left, even though it's going to change the history of the of world. the world. And he takes his stone pillars, doesn't he? He takes his stone pillars. They love a stone pillar in Portugal. Can't get enough of them. <laughs> when they take them now when they go on holiday. Anyway, <laughs> off they go. They go for months. And by Christmas, they're in about Namibia or so. They've been going for four months. And then they take this absolutely bi- – so basically the wind is against them, so they can't go any – they think they can't go any further south. And then they take – this is where our, our grasp of naval technology will come in very useful time <laughs> to explain this. They, they take this radical decision. Mm-hmm. So. Basically, instead of continuing to go south, they say, let's sail right out into the sea, to the west, into the nothingness. Because there, basically, the wind may kind of whip us around and take us in a big loop. Well, because that's what happens north of the equator, isn't it? It is. That the trade yeah. winds, you, you sail out, you go down Africa, you sail out west into the Atlantic, and then the trade winds blow you back to Portugal. I knew you were on top of all this, Tom. Yeah. yeah. I knew you were on top of all this. The yeah. rest is navigation. That's, yeah. what, uh, that's what we will be called. I'm like, what's his name? Patrick O'Brien. It turned out, actually, that Patrick O'Brien, do you know, the, the, the irony is, it turned out that he, he was making it all up. He didn't know anything <laughs> about rope or ships. <laughs> well, there you go. No one would ever say that about this podcast. That is <laughs> no, we know, we know our navigation. So anyway, they, they take this massive loop out into the Atlantic, Bartholomew Diaz and his, and his guys, and then they turn around and they see these mountains. And basically what's happened is they have been carried by the winds in this great loop around the Cape of Good Hope, and they have gone around the bottom of Africa. And they make landfall eventually um, on what's now the Eastern Cape. In uh, Mossel Bay. Is that what it's called? Mossel. So it's Dutch for muscle. Oh, that's lovely. That's, so you've got a bit of Portuguese, a bit of Dutch in this podcast. Yeah. Not only do you get top naval technology, you get great um, European languages. It's like a, it's like a university in itself. We're, we're offering all kinds of modules. Right. So anyway, they, they pitch up. The natives, they are not very keen, are they? Well, no. And they're right not to be keen, basically, because the, these kind of peculiar people with white skins and guns and yeah. a tendency to enslave you. I mean, I think it's you don't want to hang around when they turn up. Well, there's this sort of story. When Diaz was taking in water close to the beach, they sought to prevent him. And when they pelted him with stones from a hill, he killed one of them with the arrow of a crossbow. Yeah. And that, I suppose, is the sort of sets the template, doesn't it? Because there's going to be an awful lot of killing people with crossbows and things in um, in this podcast. So then the Portuguese turn around and Bartholomew Diaz, they sail all the way back. When they go around the Cape, apparently they first called it the Stormy Cape because it was very stormy. And King Zhao doesn't like that at all when they get back. And he says, you can't call it that because it's sort of too downbeat. Um, so they attain it to change it to the Cape of Good Hope yeah. because it promises, holds out hope that they're one day they'll, they'll get to India. And when they've gone around the Cape of Good Hope, they've left behind their su- supply ship, which isn't a caravel. So it doesn't have a flat bottom, bottom Dominic, or right. a triangular sail. Yeah. So it can't do what they've just done. Useless. Absolutely useless. Uh, and, and they find that it's absolutely, it's been eaten up by worms. It's rotten with worms. And so they haul it onto the beach and they burn it and have a huge great bonfire. And then they sail back. Yeah. So dubious behavior all around. Um, they get back to Lisbon in December 1488. They've been away for 16 months. They've, they've discovered more than a thousand miles of new coastline. Well, discovered, I mean. So the people who live there knew it was that. But the key thing is that they've discovered that, you know, you can round Africa. Yes. Which, of course, the Phoenicians knew, uh, and Herodotus reports it. So if he'd been reading his Herodotus, he would have known that. But, you know, there are other ways of finding out. And this is, of course, the best part of four years before Columbus. So this explains, this is one of the key reasons yeah. why the Portuguese think, well, what's the point in you heading out to the West? We've already found that we can get around Africa. Was this publicised? Or were the Portuguese keeping it to themselves? I think it's not immensely well publicized because I, I think there's a sort of a there's an enormous amount of emerging rivalry, I guess, between the Portuguese on the one hand and Castile and Aragon on the other. Because of course, up to this point, there's been no Spain. So the Portuguese are just one of many competing Iberian kingdoms. But with the marriage of Ferdinand and Isabella, you have this sort of big 
self-confident and the conquest of the Alhambra and Granada. Uh, so that's 1492, isn't it? So the Portuguese are aware that there's this big rival now. And, and there's a definite sense of competition, I think, from this point onwards that wasn't really there before. And the Portuguese defining themselves against the Spanish. So it makes sense that they would want to hold on to. You know, sometimes they want to trumpet it to boast, yeah. but sometimes they want to kind of keep it to themselves. And that is the context for, in 1494, so two years after Columbus crosses the Atlantic, yeah. um, the notorious Treaty of Tordesillas, when basically the Spanish and the Portuguese divide the world up between them. Yeah, and the Portuguese, I mean, people don't really know this, but the Portuguese trick the Spanish, effectively. They get a, they send much better negotiators to Tordesillas, and they basically fiddle with the original deal. So the deal was they're going to draw a line, a vertical line down the world. And, and in very, very simplistic terms, the Spanish will get the Western half and the Portuguese get the East. So the Portuguese have already gone East and they're going to get Africa and the Indies and so on. And the Spanish will get, will get the West. But the Portuguese, um, they basically persuade the Spanish to agree to shift the line by a thousand miles to the West. And if they hadn't done that, they wouldn't have then been entitled to get Brazil. And and so this is one of the reasons why people have argued that Portugal had already discovered Brazil by this point. But I don't think they'd discovered Brazil at this point. But we've been describing how Portuguese ships are starting to veer out westwards yeah. and ride the winds. So I think it's not beyond the band's possibility that they might have yeah, it's possible. seen something out there. It's, it's possible. I mean, who knows? Tom. Who knows? I mean, they don't, they don't settle Brazil. They don't really colonise Brazil for another few decades. Yeah. It's not their prime objective, is it? No, because they're, they're still thinking about Prester John, Spices. And India. And India and Islam. They're still yeah. absolutely all about that. And actually, the year after um, the Treaty of Tordesillas, where they've, they've cut, I mean, that, this sort of carving up the world is pretty notional at this point. Because, I mean, all they've done is they've sent the odd sort of ship around. But they have this new king, Manuel. Manuel is the great nephew of Henry the Navigator. And um, he is he is very militant. I mean, he really has this profound sense of mission that we will grab the spice trade, we will destroy Islam. You know, we've shown we can get around Africa. Let's 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 get it on. You know, let's let's go for it. And coincidentally, destroy Venice as well. I mean, yes, because the Venetians obviously have yeah, a undercut of... Venice. So so actually, when you think about it, fifty sixty years before Portugal is a nothing. It is a minnow on the absolute fringe. And now it's dividing the world up. And now, because of these splendid ships, um, they have their ambitions really are pretty boundless. And it's at this point that, you know, the, the guy that he turns to is probably the most famous of all these Portuguese characters, and that is Vasco da Gama. So I think we should take a break. And when we come back, we should tell the extraordinary but bloody story of Vasco da Gama's voyage to India. So we'll see you after the break. See you in a minute. Bold in action, severe in his orders, and very formidable in his anger. That is a contemporary description of Vasco da Gama, Dominic. Um, as you said before we before the break, uh, the most famous figure in the uh, extraordinary story of Portugal's discovery of the world. Um, and he is, I mean, he's so he's chosen by Manuel, this king, who kind of presides over the golden age, really, of yeah, Portuguese expansion. And Vasco da Gama is the man who will finally achieve this dream that's been ha haunting uh, Portugal's leaders since the time of Henry the Na Navigator of how do you get, you know, is it possible to get to India going around Africa? Yeah, so Vasco da Gama is a very hard man, I think it's fair to say. Again, like Bartholomew Diaz, we don't know much about him. He's not, there are very few records of his early life. Uh, we know that he's probably from minor nobility and that he's been sort of doing piracy and sort of corsair behavior. Um, he doesn't seem a pleasant man, does he? No, he's not a bundle of laughs. I think it's no. fair to say. He's the hard man of Portuguese expansion. And <laughs> he um, is. I mean, if you're the he hard is. man of Portuguese expansion, you're pretty hard. He's not a man who would, who would sit of an evening enjoying a glass of port and listening to some lovely Fado music. No, I think that's fair to say, isn't it, Tom? I think that's He'd probably be out fair. Crushing heads and yeah. mastering you know, people, burning them, firing crossbows at people, and grabbing diamonds. 
Yeah, he would indeed. So, um, and I think he's chosen because you know because of his hardness. He's not chosen <laughs> because he's a great seafarer or a cartographer or something. No. You know, the Portuguese absolutely know what they're they're getting <laughs> into. But what's really interesting and what is nice for you, because I know you enjoy a nice bit of Christianity, is they sail from a place that is now known as Belém, so Bethlehem. Um, so it's in the sort of western side of Lisbon. It's a massive place for tourists to go, as we'll discuss later on when we talk about the the monuments that were built after um, after these great voyages. And they they sail um, in I think four ships. So they're carracks. They're not caravels. They're bigger than caravels. So what's a carrack, Dominic? So it's bigger than a caravel. <laughs> I think that's the uh, <laughs> that's the technical. Does it, have, does it have more rope? I think it has more rope, have but I, well, I think it kind probably of it may well have also have triangular sails. I'd have to do a bit more close na- naval <laughs> technological okay. research to. Um, I'm glad you. I'm glad there's you a point at which stop, there's a point at which we should stop drawing attention to our, <laughs> our our ignorance because people will stop listening, or maybe they'd have stopped already. Actually. Stop talking about carracks then. Carracks, Well, they're in carracks. I think it's very important to say they're in carracks. <laughs> but listen, it- what's interesting for you is that they leave in this atmosphere of intense religious passion. And they're named after the archangels, aren't they? The ships. They are. The ships, ships named after the archangels. And if you read, so I mentioned Roger Crowley's book, Conqueror is an amazing book. And he has this fantastic set piece. Um, they leave on a Saturday, the 8th of July, 1497. And the huge crowds come out of Lisbon to see them go. Vasco da Gama leads them from the church down to the beach. And they're all wearing sort of special tunics and carrying candles and people are singing hymns and chanting the litany. And when they get to the water, there's a complete sort of dead silence and everybody kneels and makes their confession and they receive absolution. So Henry the Navigator has received, you know, they, they, they hark back to the permission he got from the Pope for them to go off and kind of conquer the world. And they're all sobbing with religious ecstasy. And then they get on their boats and off they go. And their carracks. And their carracks. Yeah, let's 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 gloss over the carracks from now on. So it's a it's an enormous, enormous voyage. Um so to just read from Roger Crowley's book, he says, For Vasco da Gama's men, it was an unending nightmare of backbreaking work, wormy food, foul water, terrible hygiene, and appalling weather. By the time they'd rounded the Cape of Good Hope and reached the Zambezi, many were dying of scurvy, their hands and feet grotesquely swollen, their breath intolerably fetid, their gums bloody and putrid. So, Mm. I mean, we did a couple of podcasts, well, we did a series of podcasts on holidays. This is not (laughs) a holiday. No. So they get to, by March 1498, so they've been gone for just under a year, they've got to Mozambique, and then they go up the eastern coast of Africa, they get to Mombasa, Malindi in in Kenya. And then they, they kind of cut across, don't they? Because the, yeah, the monsoon winds I mean, are in their favour. But, I mean, that's an amazing thing, though, Tom, isn't it? I mean, we're talking about Bartholomew Diaz making his big loop. I mean, this turning, you know, turning, I guess, to their right and heading out across the Indian Ocean. I mean, Amanda, you've got no idea. The sheer balls, Dominic. Yeah, technical term. They don't know where they're going. And they could easily have screwed up, couldn't they? If they got the wrong angle, if the winds had changed, if they got, you know, they sailed at the wrong time. So they know. sailed for 23 days and more than 2,000 miles across this open sea. And then they see mountains and lightning and stuff. And it's the, the Malabar coast. Yeah. So this is, um, India. This is sort of Kerala, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, you're, you're more of an India hand than I am, Tom, with your, with your gap year in India. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and my many cricket tours. Yes. Uh, was your gap year like this? Was that the same sense it of was a bit like that? Unknown? Yeah, wormy food, foul weather, terrible hygiene. Exactly. That's what. Um, I was, oh, well, that's yeah. that's the cricket tours as well. Hands and they? feet grotesquely swollen. <laughs> yes, all that kind of stuff. That's <laughs> very much what it was like. So they've been going now for three hundred and nine days. They've sailed for twelve thousand miles, and they can glimpse the coast of India. And they basically get to the place is called Calicut. And, and actually, what happens is then a complete damp script because they get there. Then they get there, and there's some Tunisians there. Yeah, so some exactly. people from yeah. some people from North Africa. Yeah, so and they're like, "Oh, what are you doing here?" And <laughs> hey, <laughs> which is utterly deflating for them. And they've brought all their their richest treasures, and they give them yes. to the uh, to the local guy, and he just laughs in their face, doesn't he? Yeah, it's terrible. So they have um, 
<laughs> 12 pieces of, I shall read this from Congress. It's 12 pieces of striped cloth, four scarlet hoods, six hats, four strings of coral, six hand washing basins, a case of sugar, and two casks each of honey and oil. And then they give them to the, um, to the sort of, the local big the local potentate's guy. The guy says, um, the poorest merchant from Mecca or any other part of India gave more. And he says to Vasco da Gama, if you want to give a present, it should be gold. And he's utterly deflated. So there is so, so there is bathos, but Dominic, how would you rate this as um, a key moment in global history? I think it's pretty big, isn't it, Tom? I mean, it's a massive moment. I mean, the funny thing is, of course, there had been, you know, Alexander the Great had gone to India and people had traded with India, hadn't they? I mean, we talked in Cleopatra about how Cleopatra had thought of fleeing to, to India. So Roman traders are definitely doing it. But for, I, I think for Europe... It's a, it's a colossal moment. And in the long run for Asia as well. Yeah. I mean, for Asia, it's a bit like kind of opening your window and suddenly a wasp flies in. I mean, they're, they're, they're small, but they're incredibly annoying. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and they kind of buzz around and sting. We should stress that since the Portuguese are, are some of the smallest people in Europe, we should stress that you're actually talking about Europeans generally rather than I am talking Portuguese. about Europeans generally. Although, let's, let's carry on with the story because the story of, I mean, I mean essentially, once the Portuguese have broken into the Indian the Pacific, I mean, they're all over the place, aren't they? They are. They, there's no stopping them. So Vasco de G gets back in um, September 1499. And actually, he he has lost two thirds of his crew to sort of scurvy, disease, you know, this, that and the other. Um, they're absolutely sort of battered and miserable and bedraggled. But they do bring back all this, all, all this spices. And that's when <laughs> Manuel writes to Ferdinand and Isabella. <laughs> exactly exactly i mean that's you a, know, how, how, many, how many cloves has columbus brought you exactly because that's the funny thing you see columbus has not is not bringing back no. the treasures that he had hoped for which is why ferdinand and isabella are constantly saying where's all the gold where's all you know where's everything you promised i mean columbus died claim, still claiming that he'd got to india he never admitted and never believed that he'd made a terrible mistake whereas the portuguese are kind of laughing well, uh, because Manuel, I mean, he really beefs up his royal titles, doesn't he? So he, he's been king of Portugal and Algarves, and he's already claimed a bit of, of Africa and so on. But now he, he claims to be lord of the conquest, navigation and commerce of Ethiopia, Arabia, Persia and India, yeah. which is putting Ferdinand and Isabella in their place. Exactly. For the Spanish, this is very, um, this is enraging. And as you say, Tom, for the next few years, the Portuguese... They send out expedition after expedition. And actually, these are often accompanied by horrendous violence. Specifically against Muslims, aren't they? Isn't it? I mean, so, so, so that militant anti Islam is such an important part of the story. Yeah. It's Vasco da Gama, he makes three voyages in total, I think it is. And this, I think it's his second voyage that they come across a, an, an Arab ship called the Miri, which is packed with pilgrims um, who have been going to Mecca. And basically Vasco da Gama, you know, he thinks it's his Christian duty. They they capture 20 children and tr take them onto their boat, forcibly convert them to Christianity, and then they basically burn the rest. Yeah. They set fire to the ship and down it goes. And Vasco da Gama thinks this is absolutely tremendous behavior. When he next goes back... That, is that when he captures all the fishermen? Yes. He captures loads of fishermen. He hangs them from his masts. Um, and the, their families all come down to the beach because they hear that um, these... Portuguese, very poorly behaved, have captured their relatives. And at this point, Vasco da Gama tells his gunners to fire in the crowd, to sort of shoot them down. And one of his men writes afterwards, seeing them cry, we jeered at them loudly, and the beach was soon cleared. So there's absolutely no sense. I mean, maybe I'm being unfair here, but quite early on with the Spanish sort of conquest of the Americas, you get people... Um, What's that guy, uh, Tom, the priest, Las Casas, you know, who are sort of breast beating about what they've seen in Cuba or in, in Mexico or whatever. But you don't really get much of a sense of this from the people on Vasco da Gama's ships, do you? I mean, they're just absolutely delighted. Because as we said, Vasco da Gama is appointed because he is a, a, a brute, basically. And as far as I gather, his, his crews are essentially the kind of the sweepings of, of, of Lisbon jails. I mean, these are... These are the most brutal men imaginable and kind of desperate, as I think you'd have to be to go on a, a, a kind of adventure into the unknown like that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. 
I mean, they, 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 are, they are men who have been chosen because they are brutal. I mean, there's also, I mean, it's in a brutal world, isn't it? Because the Portuguese see themselves, they've been fighting against the North Africans. They, they see themselves as in this sort of ideological hot war with Islam. They already have this practice with, with Muslims, um, what they call Mer de Mboka, which I won't translate, um, where they they do stuff to your mouth, but also they will shove piece, take prisoners and shove bacon fat down their throats and things. I mean, they're... This is a, a violent world, and the violence they're exporting to Asia comes out of the sort of European theatre, I suppose. And that's why it is so dangerous for them to go, because, you know, they have no friends out there. And it's not as if they're, they're exactly making friends <laughs> once they arrive there. Um, and, they, and they just decide that violence is the way. So they, they intimidate, you know, they hang people, um, yeah. menace people. Um, but they also decide that, uh, and again, I mean, it's kind of very incredibly bold strategy that they're going to grab land and fortify it and make bases out. And this becomes the, the start of a whole kind of network of Portuguese bases that come to span the, the entire world. Yeah. So they, they said by 1503, they've got two. I mean, this is just within a few years of, of, of Bartholomew Diaz going around Africa, actually. They've got two toeholds on in the Indian coast, so Cananor and Cochin. And then in 1509, uh, Manuel, who, whose ambitions know no limit. I mean, he has written to the Pope and basically said, Christians may hope that shortly all the treachery and heresy of Islam will be abolished and the Christian faith will be spread throughout the whole world. And he basically says to the Pope, I will deliver you India. I will deliver you Africa. And the weird thing is that Ferdinand has been saying exactly the same. So Ferdinand, as in Isabella, has been writing yeah. in, in identical terms. So both of them are basically <laughs> saying, we're going to conquer the world, we're going to take all the loot, and this is great because it'll win us the, the Holy Sepulchre. Yeah, because we think of the Crusades and the sort of the age of discovery as happening in different parts of history. We miss the fact that they really see themselves as crusaders, don't they? They think it's part of the same kind of continuum. And and capturing Jerusalem is there. I mean, at the end of his life, Columbus is talking about, you know, expeditions to Jerusalem and all this sort of thing. Yeah. So early 16th century, they're all over it. So there's this guy, Afonso de Albuquerque. I hope I've pronounced that right. Um, Beautifully, Tom. And he is the second European, so there's been a previous one, uh, yeah. to be appointed a viceroy of India. And won't be the last. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. The first one I think might have been called Almeida, and he's um, Albuquerque is number two, but he's the, the most important because he, he is. Do you know what they call him, Tom? You'd enjoy this. Uh, the no. Caesar of the East, the Portuguese Mars. He is a Caesar, isn't he? Because he goes around seizing things. Uh, Very good. Very good. So he grabs yeah. Goa, famous yeah. tourist destination now. Our Lord has done great things for us because he wanted us to accomplish a deed so magnificent that it surpasses even what we have prayed for. He boasts about burning the town, killing everyone. But we haven't spared the life of a single Muslim. We have herded them into the mosques and set them on fire. We have estimated the number of dead Muslim men and women at 6,000. It was, sire, a very fine deed. Um, yeah. So he's grabbed Goa. So that's adding to... So that's now three colonial possessions in India. Then they move on towards Malaysia. They capture Malacca. Uh, in 1511. And then this is an astonishing, I mean, this is a, such a, you know, they're tiny. There are so few of them. And Malacca has what? I mean, it's 100,000 people, 120,000 people. Yeah. And they just kind of sail in and grab it. And they only have kind of few hundred Portuguese. I mean, they have guns, crucially. But I think that don't the people in Malacca have guns as well? They do, but the Portuguese, they're just not prepared for the Portuguese. The violence of it. The violence of it, the onslaught from the sea, they're taken unawares. But I mean, this is um, a Cortez level victory against the odds. It is. And isn't it funny that uh, unless you'd read, I mean, I remember when I first read Roger Carrella's book when I was reviewing it, I had never heard of Afonso de Albuquerque. And he's within decades of the Portuguese setting out, just a couple of decades, basically, they've got as far as Malaysia and they're taking towns, establishing forts and colonies. He sends ambassadors to Burma to Thailand to Sumatra. He has ships that are mapping Eastern Indonesia. He has ship. He sends ships to Canton in China, and they and and Duke Orsel grab Macau, and they 
Macau, exactly, yes. It's not just the violence. It's also incredible kind of pioneering voyages. Okay, amazing and- current, yeah. And they end up, they get to Japan, don't they? they don't they found a, a colony in Nagasaki? They do, yeah, unbelievably. So a little bit later, 40, 1543, they get to the southern bit of Japan, the first Europeans to, to reach there. And then they, yeah, they actually founded Nagasaki, um, the Jesuits, I think it was. Um, again, very little known in the kind of Anglo-Saxon world, but an astonishing sort of just the visionary scale of the achievement. Of course, one carried out with enormous violence. And since we've had so much violence, maybe we should have some a tiny bit of, well, it's still violent, but it's a bit of light relief because Albuquerque also sends back to Lisbon um, a white elephant and a white rhino. And the, ri- the rhino is the one that um, Albrecht Dürer draws yeah. without having seen it. It's the first rhino to come to Europe since the um, since the time of the Romans, and the Portuguese being the Portuguese, you know what they do with the they get them to Lisbon and this huge Make crowd. Them have a fight. Everyone's they, and they say, "Great, now we'll like a child, like a child saying who would win between a lion and a shark." They basically, want, their their instinct is to say, "Now let's see who who would win the fight," but the elephant runs away. Well, it's very Roman behaviour. Yes, it is. It's very well. The elephant goes to Rome. Yeah, um, so it, get, it gets sent to the Pope, doesn't it? Yeah, so Manuel sends the white elephant to the Pope, and there's a huge. Um, there's some Indians. There's parrots. There's, it's a bit like a triumph, actually. Yeah. I mean, I wonder if that must, was in their mind. I imagine they had this huge been. parade through the streets of Rome because they're they're very alert to Pliny, um, who is describing the wealth of the world and particularly the wealth of India. I mean, there's a huge kind of influence on them. So I'm sure that that must be lurking at the yeah. back of their minds. This all this very roman behavior and the other roman behavior is that they build kind of great monuments they do i was just going to say you know that but we're talking about the romans they call the uh, the pope calls the elephant hanno which i believe is a is a is a hannibal um reference isn't it yes yes so hanno is a is a carthaginian name so it's an yeah an allusion to the carthaginians but you were saying about the monuments tom um so by now lisbon is this you know, which I suppose it wasn't exactly a backwater, but it's not one of the world's great cities before then. But now it definitely is. It's this incredibly colourful kind of entrepot of uh, peoples and and traders and ships and all kinds of stuff. Of course, lots of slaves because the the slave markets are absolutely booming. And you were saying about monuments. So there are there are two very famous monuments. This is Manuel is the king, and it's what's called Manueline architecture. And, and if you want to see, if anybody hasn't been to Lisbon and they they want to go and they want to see the, the, what kind of architecture you produce, if you are incredibly self confident and sort of puffed up with your own um, your own glory, then you go to Belen, which is in the sort of western bit of Lisbon. It's where Vasco da Gama had set off from, and it's where he's buried, isn't it? Yes, in the I think in the monastery. Yeah. Um, so there are two very p- really famous buildings that are symbols of Lisbon. So one is that it's called the Tower of Belen, which is this sort of fort, sort of watchtower kind of building, very ornate, decorated with um, the heads of the white rhinoceros and all these kinds of things. So the classic kind of monument that you see as a symbol of Lisbon. And the other, which is even more impressive, is this monastery. The monastery of the are they called the Hieronymites? They call the Geronimos in. Lisbon. I don't know what the Hieronymites are. There must be an order of monks. But it's this massive monastery. Again, unbelievably ornate, the sort of gorgeous stonework. And it's that monastery, Tom, I, I, I know you like a bit of food and drink on this podcast, where they invented the custard tart. Oh, the famous Portuguese custard yeah. tart. So the pastéis de nata or the pastéis de Belém, which you can buy in this, this is a very famous kind of cafe. Mm next to the monastery or just across the road from the monastery called the Antigua Cofetaria de Belen. And there, the custard tart, and actually Roger Crowley ends his book about Vasco, the age of Vasco da Gama with the custard tarts because he says they're basically a symbol. They are a symbol of Portuguese. Have they got coffee by the Because you have coffee with it, which is obviously an import, but they're dusted with cinnamon. And the cinnamon is the, the, the perfect symbol of what they've gone to India to get, the spice trade. So he says... Cinnamon, sugar, coffee—that combination. But they, I, I mean, they have they have gone to India for the spice, but they've also gone to India uh, as part of a kind of global crusade against Islam and to find Prester John. And pr- presumably, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't there. <laughs> yeah, by this point, so what, fifteen twenty, say, they've realised Prester John isn't out there. Yeah, and so their focus now, presumably, is starting to turn sp- just to trade. 
Yes, I think so. I mean, I think they also realize now that Islam is not going to be defeated overnight, certainly by the 1520s or 1530s. And also, they're starting to, there's a point at where, I guess there's a, there's a point with all of these things, with any empire builders, where the focus sort of tips from exploring and the sort of the glamour to the sort of humdrum job of administering. And the Portuguese are actually not very good at the latter. So to what extent then is this empire, as it emerges over the course of the 16th century, a, a prototype for the European empires that will follow? So that it's, it's based on the seas, which the Dutch and the British empires will be as well. Yeah. And basically it, it seems to consist of establishing nodes across the world. Yeah. And then linking them up and using them as trade, and and that's basically where the Dutch and the British will, will, and the English, and then the British will do as well. I think you're absolutely right, Tom. I think that's exactly what it is. So it's quite different, I think, in some ways from the Spanish Empire, which sees large scale immigration from Spain. I mean, one reason they're able to overwhelm, you know, the Aztecs or the Incas is so many people arriving. But it's also land based, isn't it? I mean, I know they have to bring all the gold back in ships, but it's not like I suppose the Spanish are as well, aren't they? They're going, they're getting the Philippines and so on. But they are, but they're also they're expanding, as you say, by land and by sea, I guess, but also by land through the Americas. The Portuguese are obviously not doing that in India. They're 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 taking little coastal enclaves and using them as as trading posts, but they're not they're not settling you know, abroad in, in huge numbers. I mean, obviously we'll come to Brazil. I think we'll probably come to Brazil in our next episode because the great expansion into Brazil really doesn't happen until slightly later. Um, but I think it's a very good, well, the Dutch and the Portuguese are absolutely implacable rivals. And again, we'll probably mention that next time. Yeah, we will, yeah. About this intense competition between the Dutch and the Portuguese. And actually at one point, the Dutch basically take over a lot of the Portuguese empire and then the Portuguese get it back again. But yeah, I think it's it's a really... It's the prototype for the Dutch Empire, I think, and for aspects of the British Empire, um, the Portuguese Empire. I mean, the Portuguese are not good at running it. So by the mid-16th century, they're already, you know, there's endless governors fighting against each other. I mean, they're literally fighting against each other. Like the kings will send out governors who have to fight their predecessors to get hold of these these sort of forts and trading stations. Um, Brazil, they go to in the 1530s, and obviously the, the slave trade starts to become a bigger and bigger issue. We'll probably talk about that next time. Um, but there's a definite sense that by the 15, by the sort of mid, mid 16th century, there's a bit of a loss of momentum, I would say, and a loss of mission. The, the sense that basically the, the Portuguese are inventing, uh, well, a crucial aspect of modernity, that they're blazing a path for globalization, for European hegemony, all this, the slave trade, um, Global trade, uh, all this, all all these things that will utterly transform not just Europe, um, but the world. But in the um, the mid sixteenth century, you have this kind of reversion back to the norm, where uh, you have a king, um, King Sebastian, who basically behaves like a crusader, and he rather than kind of focusing on um, distant lands, he he invades and attacks. Um, Mauritania, doesn't he? So he. I, I suppose you could say King Sebastião is where it all goes wrong for for Portugal to some extent. So his let me work this out. His great grandfather was Manuel, um, and he succeeds when he's a boy, Sebastião, and his grandmother, and then a cardinal run the country for him. Well, the cardinal is his uncle, isn't it? That's right. Yes, uh, and he's a, a, a crucial figure. Um, so he and he is known as <laughs> Henrique the Chaste. Well, that's pretty good for a cardinal, isn't it? I mean, yeah, yeah. So but this, sort of, this, this will become an important part of what then happens. <laughs> yes. Well, so Sebastian becomes, or Sebastião in Portuguese, he comes of age in in 1568, and I guess I wonder whether there's a sense that Portugal's great glory days are already ebbing into the past, and so that makes him even more determined to sort of stake his own, to cut a dash. Yes, to cut a dash, and he decides he's going to lead a crusade against the Moroccans, and he makes a terrible error, Tom, which is to trust Philip II of Spain, who says to him, "Rookie's error." Yeah, sure, I'll I'll send you supporters. I'll send you know people to help you. They all assemble all these troops and mercenaries. They assemble at Cadiz, and the Spanish are nowhere to be seen. You know, all these promised Spanish reinforcements aren't there, but they go anyway. Sebastião and his men. So this is 1578. They cross the um, the Mediterranean. They land 
in Morocco. And um, I mean, you were in a previous episode, I think it was, Tom, you were you were um, complimenting the Crusades, but this is not a crusade that goes. Um, you said some Crusades went better than others. This is this one is that no- doesn't go well. Doesn't go well because in their very first battle, they're absolutely routed, absolutely routed. And he presumably dies. He's the last that's seen of him is he's charging the enemy, but his body is never found. So the mystery of what has happened to him, he leaves no heir. And so he is succeeded by uh, his uncle, the Cardinal Enrique the Chaste. But by definition, if you're called the Chaste, you're unlike, and you're kind of 60 or whatever, you're unlikely to be producing an heir. And so when Enrique the Chaste dies in 1580, the guy who is next in line for the throne is none other than Philip II of Spain. Very much not a friend, I think it's fair to say, of the rest of his history, Philip II of Spain. He hasn't appeared in this podcast before. But now that he has, I just want to absolutely state my colours to the mast and say, not my favourite person, <laughs> not a fan. Well, he's he's not he, he's not behaving well here. Um, no, and he he essentially well. So he says uh, about Portugal: I inherited it, I bought it, and I conquered it. So, yeah, in every way he takes over. Although having said that, I think we're we're doing Philip II down because he does actually behave quite well. I mean, he doesn't. He treats Portugal with dignity. Portugal remains, yeah. in, you know, supposedly an independent kingdom. And I think actually, Tom, we haven't really touched on this as much as we could have done. But Spain itself is a very recent creation at this point, and you know, Spain is itself a patchwork of kingdoms, isn't it? Obvious, most obviously, Castile and Aragon. So Philip II is adding another kingdom. Um, so he wouldn't necessarily absorb it because, I mean, his fa- his predecessor, Charles V, had been ruling all kinds of different places without combining them into one. So the Portuguese, who already have, I think it's fair to say by now, a sense of their own distinctiveness, which has been forged in the previous hundred years because of their own explorations and their own missions, they have no intention of becoming Spaniards. And it's a bit like Scotland and England, I suppose. You can't. It's going to be very difficult to combine them. Uh, the, the parallel is, I guess, with uh, with Catalonia, which similarly has a, a very strong sense of its distinctiveness, gets absorbed into what will become the Kingdom of Spain and stays part of Spain. But the difference with Portugal, with, with, and the same thing might well have happened with Portugal, but I suppose the difference is that Portugal does have this, I mean, it has a vast global empire that is yeah. Portuguese. And as we enter the 17th century, so there are other powers that are arriving, Protestant powers, um, of whom the Dutch are the cutting edge. And the Dutch start to look with envious eyes at all these Portuguese possessions. And so the question of um, whether the Spanish monarchy will help the Portuguese to see these, you know, these Dutch pirates as the Portuguese sees and help see them off is, is crucial to whether Portugal will become a loyal part of this emergent kingdom. Yeah, because also the Portuguese feel, I think, that they've been dragged into this world war against the Dutch. Yeah, because the, because they're yoked to the Spanish. Yeah, um, so, and the Spanish don't care about protecting the Portuguese possessions, and the Portuguese. You definitely get this sense, I think, by the beginning of the 17th century, that Portugal has been hard done by in in being sort of united with Spain, and I think it's at that point, isn't it, where you start to get well, you definitely get at the end of the 16th century all of these imposters. So people who basically say, you know, Sebastian, who was charging towards those lines and never seen again. Here he's I actually, am. <laughs> yeah. He's, he's, <laughs> Despite um, the fact I can't speak Portuguese in one, one of them. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> well, there's one of them who's, um, so the first one is a sort of a, a, a guy who's is just an ordinary commoner. Then there's a guy who's a stone cutter from the Azores. Um, he's obviously not, um, he's, he's very poorly treated. He's hanged. But but isn't the one who doesn't speak Portuguese at all? Which yeah, is... he's from Naples. He <laughs> yeah, <doesn't>... so <laughs> yes, I think that's pushing. <laughs> it's and, very uh, Perkin Warbeck and Lambert Simnel, isn't it? So... But basically, it becomes clear that he is dead, and so then you start to get these kind of weird King Arthur type stories that actually he he is hidden away and he's waiting to come back. Um, and this is a, a, a fantasy that sustains the Portuguese um, under Spanish rule. But I still think I still think it's possible that Portugal might have accepted Spanish rule except for what happens in the 17th century, which is basically the First World War. And I think that we should take a break here, come back tomorrow with a further episode, and we will begin with the First World War. So So we will see you then.
See you then. Goodbye. Adios. Bye-bye.